Hello there and welcome to the very first edition of Because I Can't Afford the Expensive Stuff. So the other week on the TV, I saw Kevin Peterson with a bunch of his mates, um, Freddie Flintoff, um, Ollie Mers, Chris Froome, all raising money for charity on a cycle race. So that got me thinking, this sounds like a great way of having fun and getting fit at the same time, except there's one problem. What if you don't have one of those bikes and instead you have one of these? So in this video, I'm going to show you how to get your cross trainer to work with Swift. A bit like this, except with your avatar moving. Okay, so I won't be covering Swift software in this video. There are a ton of videos available on YouTube covering this topic in great detail, and I'd encourage you to go and check those out. But it is worth taking a look at the hardware used to ride on Swift. Uh, and broadly speaking, there are two routes you can take. One is the smart route, and one is the dumb route. So we're looking at um, the certified Swift trainers currently, and you can see they range from 429 to just shy of 3K. And on the left, we've got the dedicated or single dancing version, and then these other two, um, well, let's click on it and I can show you. So they effectively um, replace the rear wheel of your bike. And these devices are designed to accurately measure the rider's speed and power and output these to the Swift software. Uh, now the second version is using what's called a dumb trainer and we'll take a look at that now. So whereas the smart trainers contains all of the gubbing is required to speak to the Swift software. A dumb trainer, on the other hand, such as this one, uh, is essentially just a, a metal A-frame that jacks up your rear wheel and can provide some resistance to simulate road conditions. Uh, but the problem here is there is no way to communicate with um, Swift software and so you will need to add some additional sensors uh, so let's check those out right so speed sensors come in two varieties first type is simply a device like this um, and this straps around the hub of your rear wheel faster you pedal, the built-in accelerometers uh, detect your speed and in turn transmit this to the Swift app. So the second type of sensor also connects to the Swift app via Bluetooth uh, but in this case it doesn't have built-in accelerometers instead let me bring a picture up here we go it attaches to the bike's chain stay and a magnet is attached to one of the spokes and each time the spoke passes the sensor this is registered as one rpm uh, so essentially the faster you pedal uh, the faster your speed will be simulated on the swift app Hopefully that gave you a flavour of the basic requirements to get running with Swift. Again, if you're looking for a more detailed explanation, I'd encourage you to search YouTube. There are some excellent videos out there. Um, that's certainly how I built my knowledge and perhaps I'll uh, list some of my favourites in the comments below. The other go-to place, surprise, surprise, is the Swift website itself. Now, um, I personally found the information quite overwhelming. 
but in terms of the elliptical trainer build um, I mainly wanted to check out the speed and cadence sensor section which reminds me I did forget to mention let me go back to the magnetic sensor I showed you earlier uh, this sensor also measures cadence now I'm not going to go into detail on the difference between cadence and the speed sensor and speed sensor suffice to say that the speed sensor measures the speed of your that your rear wheel is rotating and the cadence sensor measures the speed at which your crank arm is turning so now we've got that out of the way let's go back to zwift.com okay so zwift does state on their website that they support all bluetooth speed sensors uh, but they also list uh, a number of supported models so i guess if you want to guarantee compatibility perhaps you want to go for one of those uh, but for those of you less interested in the detail um, you can be safe in the knowledge that all you need to get up and running with Swift is a compatible Bluetooth speed sensor everything else is optional and that's exactly what I'm going to do next I'm going to test out a couple of sensors and see how we can get them to talk to the Swift app So now we know what type of sensors communicate with Swift, the next step is to figure out how they can be modified to work with an elliptical trainer. So not knowing which type of sensor would be most effective to work with an elliptical trainer, I ended up purchasing both the magnetic and the accelerometer type. I got both these from Amazon, uh, the magnetic I paid about 17, 18 pounds and the accelerometer type 24. Um, now as well as being cheap, the other reason why I purchased these two models is because they, in the description they both specified as being Swift compatible. So now we've got our sensors let's go over to the elliptical trainer and figure out how we're going to install them so a quick mention of some additional components that you might also need for your build so depending on the construction of your cross trainer and placement of the sensor uh, a stick of these 8mm neodymium magnets and you do get a spoke magnet with the Kuspu, but in addition to that a uh, couple of extras may come in handy uh, all will be revealed in the next section so the iGPS was super easy to install a um, bit of double sided tape stuck to the side of the cross trainers flywheel I did try different orientations uh, but none of them had a major impact on the overall performance So I've got my son Noah to pedal while I record the results. Um, we kicked off at about 70 RPM and as you can see not great we only managed 7 watts of power and only managed to get our avatar on his saddle. Um, ramped things up to 90 plus to see if that made any difference. and still only 10 watts and just about got our avatar moving it's another great result for the iGPS okay, so next we take a look at the Kuspu um, the install for this one was a little more tricky 
Um, as you can see in the top left, what I did to mimic the chain stay that it would usually fix on, I used a bit of uh, plastic pipe and cut that in half. Uh, and then I attached the uh, piece of pipe to the frame of the cross trainer. The install of the magnet was much simpler. Um, the wheel was made of a plastic material and I simply drilled a 2.5 millimeter hole and was able to screw the spoke magnet into this. However the magnet did sit quite low and I couldn't be sure that they would register with the sensor. So in order to address this I simply added some additional magnets and that did the trick perfectly. So once again I got Noah to be my test pilot and uh, this time round we connected both the speed sensor and the cadence sensor. Started at about 60 to 70 RPM and definitely an improvement on the IGPS. No problem in getting our man on the saddle. And achieved uh, about 3 to 5 MPH. So decided to ramp things up to 90 plus. And unfortunately, this time round we hit a bit of a gradient in the game and our man came to a complete standstill. So close but no cigar. Okay, so we're back from those tests and I think it's fair to say that I didn't get the result that I was hoping for. But hey, that's okay because that's exactly what problem solving is all about. Uh, trying something out, understanding why things didn't go as expected, uh, applying a different solution and hopefully getting a better result next time. So what I've decided to do for phase two is to take the testing inside on a bench and to try to simulate the conditions required to get these sensors to work with the Swift software. And then it's just a case of figuring out how we can get the cross trainer to perform in a similar way. Uh, so let me talk you through the um, setup. So for the iGPS sensor, I've attached this to a piece of plastic pipe, roughly the same diameter as the cross trainer wheel that we used for our first test. This is attached to a motor which in turn is connected to an adjustable power supply. Uh, so the plan here is to see how fast we need to spin the sensor in order to get our avatar moving on the Swift software. And as you can see, the sensor is connected to the Swift companion app. Uh, so the idea is to record the speed that the sensor is spinning using a tachometer and compare those results to the output on the Swift companion app. Okay, so this is the first test of the IPS sensor on the test bench. Uh, crank things up to about 80 RPM on this one. I did try 60 to 70 and got um, absolutely nothing. As you can see, uh, with 80 we just about get our avatar on the saddle. Uh, so this is not looking good for our cross trainer. Second test of the iGPS speed sensor. This time we're running at about 120 RPM. 120 is 
flat out on a cross trainer. So the max you'll probably get using this type of sensor is about 7 to 8 MPH. So as a final test for the iGPS, I was curious to see how it would perform if mounted as designed on a bike hub. And yeah, as you can see, uh, it performs pretty well. No problem at getting at 20 plus MPH. Um, so definitely scope for this working with something like a spin bike. Although in terms of accuracy, uh, my guess is your speeds might be way off. Right, so we're going to apply pretty much the same method that we use for the iGPS uh, for the Kusbu. Uh, the only difference is that we have now positioned the vice in its uh, horizontal axes and this is simply because it's easier to lay the Kusbu sensor flat to allow the pipe to pass over the sensor. So the plan here is to see if we can artificially increase the rate of speed by using a two magnet configuration uh, which theoretically should give us twice the power for half the effort. Uh, so let's see how we get on. Right, so first bench test with our Kusbu. Um, 60 to 70 RPM, couldn't even move our avatar. So I've increased to 100 RPM. And as you can see, on the flat, we achieved an average of about 8 MPH. Right, so we're back for our second test of the Kusbu, and this time we're up to 200 RPM. And as expected, we're doubling our speed from the first test, so that all checks out good. Um, yeah, and this is the type of pace that I'd like to achieve. Uh, so now it's just about figuring out how we can recreate this experience on the quad trainer. So having had the chance to analyse the two magnet configuration data, it's still clear that we need to increase our speed with less RPM. So what I've decided is to go for a three magnet configuration, which you can see here. So I've spaced them equally on the flywheel. Um, so fingers crossed this will hit the sweet spot. So I've got Noah testing for me again. Um, let's see how we get on. So we're going to ramp up to 60, uh, road conditions are flat, yep it's looking good, we're 250 watts, 14 mph, that looks good, happy with that. So for the second test, we're going to hit an uphill section of the course, hold the same 60 RPM and see how it impacts our speed. Yep, clearly reduced the speed by almost half. So again, very happy with that. And for a final test, let's see how a downhill section of the course affects our speed. Again, holding the same 60 RPM. I'd say that's pretty realistic. And definitely would say a three magnet configuration for this build is the way to go. So in my case, a three configuration magnet was definitely the way to go. Uh, but I'd be keen to hear how you guys get on with your builds. And perhaps some of you out there might be thinking of converting other types of exercise machines to work with Swift. Uh, I'm pretty certain that anything that works with a flywheel can somehow be adapted 
uh, to work in a similar way. And thanks for sticking with me till the end of this video. I know it was a long one. Uh, I'll probably um, do an edited version for people who are less interested in the detail. Um, but for now, enjoy Swifting on your cross trainer. And once again, please leave comments below and let me know how you get on. Stay safe and be healthy.